Good morning and welcome to worship at St. Lawrence. Um, we're going to mix things up today and do the sermon first. Very first thing. Um, for those of you who were here last week, uh, you may remember that uh, when we were talking about this process of reconciliation that we have been on as a community with First Nations individuals. And uh, part of the guiding paradigm for us in that process is that you cannot appreciate somebody else's culture and, and the things that they value unless you understand your own culture and your own, the things that you value, right? And so First Nations folks talk about ceremony and they talk about medicine, the good medicine that they have, and they talk about the, the role of the ancestors. And I'm like, well, that, those things don't mean anything to us if we don't understand our own ceremony. If we don't understand the way that we have medicine, strong medicine that we use, if we don't understand our connection to ancestors and the things that we do. So last week, we started out by talking about our sacred space, right? And we talked about uh, the things that are here in the sacred space, the cross and the, 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 the sacred fire that we keep lit to remind us of the presence of God both here and in that lamp over there, we talked about the presence of water, the, give, the water that gives us life and sustains us, and the role that water has in terms of washing and cleansing and baptism. And we talked about what's behind that little door over there and what happens on this altar or this table, right? So we talked about all those things. If you missed that sermon, it's still online. You can <laughs> go and listen to it. You don't have to watch the whole service, just fast forward, because... Uh, I think many people commented that it was very helpful. So today, I just want to talk about this service that we're going to do. And those of you who were last week, uh, um, and, but to, in order to talk about the service, I have to talk about, well, who are we? Who are we that do this thing? Who are we that, want to, that do this ceremony um, in this place and are the ones who conduct and, and facilitate this ceremony? Um, so I'm going to start us out by asking you, why are you here this morning? What prompted you to get up on a Sunday morning and come to this place and do this thing? Why are you here? Natasha. So to maintain your connection with this community so that you have the power you need to be a better person. Great. What else? Why else are you here? To sing. To sing. I love it. You're here to sing. Because why? What does singing do for you? It feeds my soul. It feeds your soul. Exactly. And to sing in community, but it, the, the, that process of singing in community and just singing feeds your soul. It's deeply, profoundly spiritual at some level. Why else are you here? To learn. To learn. Right? We're, we're, to learn what? To learn economics? To learn... <laughs> okay. To learn about the things, to learn about the spiritual journey that we're on, right? And the things we know uh, in regard to the spiritual journey that we're on. To celebrate God's presence. Wow. To celebrate God's presence. It brings me a sense of peace. It gives you a sense of peace. Yeah. Have a meal together. Have a meal together. Yeah. I'm going to encourage those who are standing. If you want to sit, sit. Because I'm going to go on. This is the sermon. <laughs> um, to have a meal together. <laughs> yes. And did you start out by saying the power of fear? Power. Oh, the power of spirit. Right, good. So the power of spirit in our lives and how coming together as community and, and following these things helps us be better in community. Right? Yeah, Ross. Gratitude for finding faith. Gratitude for finding faith. Right? All of these things. I mean, you guys are all giving voice to, I think, the, the multitude of reasons why we gather. We're people who are on a journey. We're people who hunger spiritually. We're people who desire to, to know something about the divine, to know something about love. We're people who need community, 
and the presence of community and the, 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 the impact that has because we can't do it by ourselves. We gather together because we're better together than we are by ourselves, right? And we come to be fed. We come to be nurtured. We come to have our souls inspired. We come to have our, our minds stirred. We come to have a sense of peace. We come to have a sense of connection with God. That's who we are as a people who gather on a Sunday morning. And so that's what we've done as we've gathered. Um, and so then I want to talk about as people who gather, I want to talk about um, our role as ministers, <laughs> basically. Our role as people who, who are here to live out the, 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 the values of the kingdom of God. Most of us have been baptized, either when we were infants or when we were adults, right? And in Anglican theology, that's the foundation of what we do and who we are. So at our baptism, vows were made. On our behalf, if we were baptized as, as infants, vows were made on our behalf by parents and sponsors, and then we recommitted those vows at our confirmation. Or if we were baptized as adults, we made those vows ourselves, right? Uh, we don't often think about the vows that we make, but I want to talk a little bit about the vows that we make. So Peter, if we can get those on the screen there. These are our baptismal vows. Um, that again are made on our behalf and we don't often think about them. And so, will you back up? Those are that's a farther ahead than we want to be. There we go. All right, this is the first vow that's made. Can I have somebody read that out, please? Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer? Will you continue in the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, and then the breaking of bread and the prayers, right? So we are an apostolic people. We're an apostolic church. We believe that Jesus had 12 disciples, 12 apostles who then passed on their ministry to their disciples and their apostles who then passed on their ministry to their disciples and their apostles. And each time there's this laying on of hands that happens and that laying on of hands keeps going. And so that every time somebody is ordained or confirmed or baptized, there's this laying on of hands and this passing on of this tradition. Like we're, we're an apostolic people. So when it says, will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, that's actually what we're doing right here, right now. In the breaking of the bread, that's what happens on this table and in the prayers, right? So at your baptism, a commitment, a vow was made to do what we're doing right now, right? And we responded, I will with God's help, right? Because whenever, we're, because it actually, I mean, we're inadequate. <laughs> we don't do it fully. We don't do it, you know, and so we, 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 we do it, you know, we, we do it, but we actually need the help of God to be able to do it and the presence of God to do it. What's the next vow? Will somebody read that, please? Will you preserve and resist evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? Okay, will you persevere in resisting evil? We're people who believe that in the beginning God creates, and God creates a good creation, and that God loves and that we're called to love God with our whole heart, soul, and mind, and love our neighbor as ourselves, and love our neighbors and love ourselves, right? And evil are the things that, ter- keep, that, that, that distort that, that, that distort the goodness of God's creation. Evil are the things that keep us from flourishing, that keep us from entering into the freedom that God has created us to be. We are all created in God's image, And evil are the things that distort and mar the image of God within us. And so we are, as a people of faith, we're called to resist those things that mar us, that distort us, that enslave us, that keep us from being fully the people that God creates us to be. And whenever you fall into sin, which if our call is to love God, love our neighbor, and love ourselves, 
Sin is a failure to love. Sin are those moments where we don't love well, where what we do actually harms somebody or harms ourselves or impedes the flourishing in some sense. And so that happens. We, sometimes we have these moments where we, we love well and we love richly and we love deeply. And sometimes we have moments where we fail at loving well. And in those moments where we fail, we're called to repent, to turn, to change our direction, to not keep doing the thing that is causing harm. That's what repentance means. It's to turn, to change. And return to the path that God calls us, right? So we make a vow to enter into our, this process. And we say, I will with God's help. Because this is hard. This is harder than just showing up on church on Sunday morning, right? <laughs> this is a harder one. But I will with God's help. All right, what's the next vow? Will somebody read that, please? Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? The good news. In the Old Testament, the, the refrain in the Old Testament in the Hebrew Scriptures is that God is a gracious God slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and mercy. That's the good news. We believe that our God is good. We believe that God is gracious, abounding in love and steadfast mercy. That God has created us all in the image of God and there is goodness in creation. And despite the, our failures of love, despite the forces that oppress us, God works to set us free. That's the good news. It's this conviction that God is good, that we are loved, and that we can love in return. And so we say, yes, I'll proclaim that, and not just talk about it <laughs> by word, but by example. I will strive to live this thing out. And that, too, we do, sometimes we do this well. And sometimes we fail miserably at it. So we say, I will with God's help, right? What's the next vow that we make? Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbors yourself? We believe that all of us are created in the image of God. And so if we believe that all of us, all persons, are created in the image of God, are we willing to seek Christ in all persons? In Muslim persons, in Hindu persons, in poor persons, in rich persons, in LGBTQ persons, in non-LGBTQ persons, all persons. Will we seek to recognize Christ in all persons and love our neighbor as we love ourselves? Sometimes we do this well. Sometimes we do it adequately. Sometimes we fail. Right? But we commit to doing it. We make a vow to be on this path because we believe that this is the best way to be in this world. This is what we strive for. It's aspirational. And we, we commit to being on that trajectory. And we say, I will with God's help because we need God's help to do this well. What's the next vow we make? Will you strive for justice? Oh, I'm sorry. Let's have one of you guys read it. <laughs> Will you strive for justice and peace among the people and respect the dignity of every human being? Okay, will you strive for justice and peace and respect the dignity of every human being? That's, that's a huge category, right? It says strive for justice. It doesn't say achieve justice. It says strive for justice, right? And it, it, it necessitates a conversation amongst us in terms of what is justice? What is peace? You know, Martin Luther King famously said, peace isn't the absence of conflict. It's the presence of justice. Right? That's how he defined peace. 
Right? So we're making a commitment to strive for this and to respect the dignity of every human being. It's connected to the previous one of loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. You know, but how do we do this? We can't do this in isolation. We need to do this in community. We need to do it in conversation with each other about what this looks like. Right? And so we strive to do it. And we say, I will, with God's help. And the last vow we make is relatively new. They've added this during my lifetime. So some of you, when you were baptized, this wasn't a vow that was made on your behalf, right? But anybody who's baptized now, it is a, it is a vow that is being made. Can somebody read it, please? Will you strive to safeguard the integrity of God's creation and respect, sustain, and renew the life of the earth? All right. Will you strive to safeguard the integrity of God's creation and respect, sustain, and renew the life of the earth? This, again, is another one of those that needs conversation. What does that mean exactly? And how do we live that out collectively? Because we can't do it in isolation. We need to do it collectively, right? And so we're making a commitment not to have it figured out, we're making a commitment not to do it perfectly, but we are making a commitment to strive for it, to aspire towards it, to believe it. And again, this is one of those things that sometimes we do it well and sometimes we don't. But we say we will with God's help because we need God's help. All right. Thank you, guys. You can end the screen. This is the foundation in Anglican theology. This is the foundation for our call as a people to living out our ministry in the world. So in Anglican theology, we believe that there is a priesthood of all believers. That in some sense, all believers, all baptized people are called to live out what it means to be people of God and there's a lay ministry, and that's what it is. That all of us are called to do this thing in the world. And we need help doing it. And we need nourishment to do it. And we need motivation to do it. We need to come together and sing so that when it feels like it's overwhelming, our spirits can be lifted and we can find the strength of song to help keep us going in it. We can come together and we can pray and we can, you know, pray for the power and presence of God to, to assist us in this process, right? So what we do here on Sunday morning, this ceremony that we engage in and the medicine that we have here in this place, we take to equip us to do this thing, to live it out, our ministry as lay people. And all of Anglican theology begins in that baptismal covenant. They call it the baptismal covenant that we make. So, in this service, when we, when we live it out, we do this ceremony that we call worship, and we set some people apart to play specific roles. Right? So, in this community, some people are set apart to be lay readers, and some people are set apart to do prayers of the people. And some people are set apart to be chalice bearers when we have chalices and do communion. And some people are set apart to be side persons and crucifers, right? All of those roles are necessary for helping this liturgy that we do happen. Liturgy comes from the Greek word liturgia, which means the work of the people. So our ceremony here is the work of the people. It's the work of all of us who are coming together to do this thing that will help feed us and nourish us for the ministry that, we have, that we're called to do in the world, right? Um, so that first order, they call it the, 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 the order of baptism, all of us participated in that order of baptism. But then there are other orders. There's the order of being called and ordained as a deacon. There's another order of being called and ordained as a priest, and there's another order of being called and ordained as a bishop. And each of those orders is a way in which some but the community has called and set apart certain individuals for certain responsibilities. But it's the community that calls them. So 
way back in the day, I used to be a Lutheran. And I was at a Lutheran church um, where I was on the worship and I was chair of the worship and music committee of that Lutheran church, and I was on the parish council. And when I moved to, I left, I was in California, and I moved to Seattle to uh, get my training as a, as a mental health therapist. And before I left, the worship and music committee handed me this cross. And they said to me, we think you're called to pastoral ministry. We think you should be a pastor. And so I didn't do anything with that right away. But when I moved to Seattle, I became part of an Anglican church, an Episcopal church in Seattle. And I went on a process of, at that part, I be, I'm the, after I became an Anglican, I went on a process of discernment in that church with people in that church as, as to whether or not they perceived that I might have a call to be a priest. And they affirmed, yes, we think you have a call to be a priest. And so they referred me to the diocese, and there was another discernment process that happened. And I was then ordained as a priest. I was set apart as a priest in community. And it was, began with the people calling me, right, and led to that ordination. And the same thing happens for deacons. It's the same process for deacons. They're called in that same way. And even then, in terms of when I came to this community, it is the people of this congregation that called me to serve that role. Like the bishop didn't impose me on this place, and I didn't just show up one day and said, hey, here I am, take me. <laughs> this people called me and said, we want you to play this role in our community. Right? And so I'm here because of your call to me to do this thing. Right? Um, so, but my ministry begins with the vows I made at my baptism. My ministry begins with the same vows that you have made and my striving to fulfill the same vows that, you, that all baptismal people have made. And the same is true of the, of the deacon. So the difference between a deacon and a priest, you know, like some people are called to be chalice bearers and some people are called to be readers and some people are called to be, you know, do prayers of the people. The priest is called, ultimately, to tend to worship within the sanctuary. I'm called to the affairs of the house, the affairs of the sanctuary, um, and, and what happens in this community. Uh, the deacon is called to be in the world and to bring the world into the church, and then to bring the church out into the world. So we have two fundamental calls. I'm called to tend to what happens in this place. Pat our deacon is called, and Wally, our deacon, we're called to go be in the world, go out in the world, and, and bring, us, bring the world in here and bring us out in the world, right? And so that we can live our baptismal vows <laughs> of striving for justice and peace, of respecting the dignity of every human being, of loving our neighbor as ourself. And then from amongst priests and deacons, when the need arises, somebody is called to be a bishop. But the bishop's call, too, is founded in those baptismal vows that they make, right? So I just want to give you a sense of why all of us are doing what we're doing and the roles that we play in this service. And, I, and to, to think about, well, why, why am I here? <laughs> you know, what's my role? What's Pat's role? You know, and the things that Pat does, I mean, she reads the gospel and she calls us out at the end of the service because the, the gospel represents the inbreaking of God in our lives. It's that good news that we are called to then proclaim by word and example out in the world. And at the end, Pat leads us out. All right. So that's who we are. We've talked about the sacred space. We've talked about the actors in the, the, the ceremony, the people who act, the people who do things in the ceremony. So I want to talk about our ceremony, our sacred ceremony. And I'll start out with just the gathering part today, and then next week we're going to talk about the word, why we read these sacred words, why we, why we read these words that are thousands of years old and written in another time and place, uh, what, what we do with that, and then what we do with our sacred meal on the table. I'll talk about those things next week, but I want to just start today by talking about the gathering. 
So when the service begins, you all come from wherever we come from. We gather, we assemble here. And then when the service starts, I will stand at the back and I offer a prayer. And basically what I do is lift our hearts and our spirits towards God. Right? It's, it's a recognition of the divine presence within us, around us, above us below us. It's just a recognition that we don't just live and move and have our being you know, in material reality, that we live and move and have our being in the divine, in the presence of God. So I will pray a prayer that will call us to be aware of the presence of the divine amongst us. And then I'll do this call to worship. You know, at the beginning of the, you can open up your bulletins and, you know, see these pieces that we're going to do. We do a call to worship, which is basically a way of centering ourselves. It's a way we've been having, we've, we've come from, from afar, wherever we've come from, where we've had, you know, we've had conversation with our friends and the people we're reconnecting with. And so we have this moment where we then call ourselves to do the thing we're about to do and call ourselves to our ministry. So call to worship, I mix up that call to worship seasonally. And then... That happens at the beginning, before anything's happened, and then we will sing a sacred song. Because we are people who have sacred songs. And these sacred, some of these sacred songs have been sung for centuries. And were written by people in other times and places and around the world. So we will come together and we will sing our sacred song, uh, one of our sacred songs, and as we sing our sacred song, the cross and the, the word, Pat will carry the word into our midst. So the cross and the word and myself will flow in and come into our midst. And we'll have a moment where we pause and we acknowledge the holiness of God in our midst. Right? Right? So in many ways, it's symbolic of the inbreaking of God into our lives. So that's what happens. This cross is being carried. The word is being carried. It's symbolic of the way that God breaks into our lives and into the being present with us. And, and there's, you know, uh, some churches will actually at that moment light the candles as part of the pre pre procession to symbolize the presence of God in our lives. And then, after the cross is then put over there and we, we, we assemble, I say these words. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I am making a pronouncement that God is in our midst. And the grace of God, the love of God, and the community of the Holy Spirit is here with us. And it's an invitation to receive it. And when you're standing in the presence of the divine, when you're standing in the presence of the holy, right? There's a sense of, and you're standing in the presence of love, you want to look your best at some level. There's a, often an awareness sometimes of your own inadequacy, right? When people go on dates, right? Whenever you're dating somebody for the first time and there's some chemistry, like, yeah, you want to look your best and, and, you know, you want them to see you well. And so, liturgically, we have just, the inbreaking of God into our lives, we've been proclaimed the grace, peace, love of God, community of the Holy Spirit, and now we're like, uh, I'm not worthy or I don't feel clean, I feel like I need to take a shower, or whatever. Because what we say is, in the, this next prayer is called the Collect of Purity. It says, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. We're acknowledging that we are in the presence of God, and God knows us, God sees us. 
God sees the wonderful ways we have lived in this world this week and the ways we've loved well. And God sees the ways we've failed to love well. And so we say, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. So that's part of our response to being in the presence of God. And then there is this inbreaking of music, the Gloria, which is always a hymn of praise. And it's singing the same song, it's singing the same words that angels sing. It's like the shepherds, you know, gathered on that Christmas Eve and they're out there and there's a host of heaven and the host of heaven is like, Gloria. It's the song of the host of heaven. And so we have this inbreaking of the song of the host of heaven into our sacred space, into our sacred time. Remember, this is not just October 24th. We are in God's sacred time. And so the inbreaking of God's sacred time into our space, we sing in this song, this Gloria. And then we have a final prayer, which is the collect, which the collect means it's a collection. It collects the themes from the readings we're about to read. And the collect... um, captures those themes to kind of give us a heads up about what the themes of the day will be. And then, so that whole piece right there is the gathering. It's what gathers us, what centers us. And then from that point on, we're going to do two things. We're going to listen to these sacred texts, these sacred words, and the preacher's going to preach on his or her reflection of those sacred texts and sacred words. And we will pray as a response to that and um, have a a moment of peace. So that's the part of the reflection and our response to the word. And then we're going to share a sacred meal and break this bread and continue our prayer and be fed in the ways we need to be fed. So we're being fed by word and we're being fed by Eucharist. That's the structure and form of our liturgy. And so I'll talk next week about those parts of the word and the sacrament. So everything that happens after this point, I'll talk about next week. So now we're going to do worship, (laughs) right? Um, You've just had the sermon, so I won't preach again. (laughs) And the people said, amen, or alleluia. You can say alleluia. Alleluia.